Good morning everyone and welcome to our Sunday morning service here at the Old Presbyterian Church of Lavan in Coldwater. Just to say that Paul is on the mend and he's doing really well and he thanks you for his continued prayer. So thank you for that. So um, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 27. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices and with my song I will praise him. Our first psalm this morning is from Psalm 121. Psalm 121 and John is going to play for us. <laughs> shepherd. You are our shepherd that leads us and guides us and helps us in every part of our life. We pray, Father God, this morning that we will have ears to hear your word, that your word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, that you would lead us and guide us in all truth. We thank you, Father God, that your word restores our soul, that it leads us in paths of righteousness, Lord, for your name's sake. We thank you, Father God, when we accept you and receive you, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and that we are made in your image and likeness, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that you have a plan for us, a plan and a future full of hope, Father, that you uh, planned for us from the very beginning. We thank you, even though we walk through dark times, Lord, even though we walk through difficult times, you're with us and you never leave us, or forsake us. Father God, we know that you never gave us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, a spirit of power, and a spirit of a strong mind. Lord, we thank you that you strengthen us, that you're our shield, our protection, Lord, that we trust, when we trust in you, you give us incredible help, Father God, and we thank you for your grace that is given to us in abundance, and we thank you, Father God, that we can come before you today and praise your holy name. Lord, these prayers and all of our prayers, we say the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The reading this morning is taken from John, 1 John, and I'll, I'll read from chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. So that's 1 John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, 
which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness, and declare to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have no fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen, and may God bless this word this morning. Now, in this passage that I've just read, John is really basking in his uh, delight um, with the fellowship, the God of light, the God of love, and the God of light. He desperately is trying to convey how wonderful it is to be in a relationship with God. Uh, he's seen him, he's been with him, he's heard him, he's touched him, and he's just trying to convey this to the people in this letter. So this morning, I would like to speak to you about your relationship with God. And I'll tell you how I came to this. I was listening to something, and you'll know this expression, it said in the world, and it said probably in churches as well, because it relates to this scripture, um, that confession is good for the soul. So why is it that confession is good for the soul? I immediately thought on 1 John 1 9, it says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it made me think about people's relationship with God and how they really see God, um, their perception of God. Do they believe he's a good God or do they believe he's a punishing God that they don't quite make the mark? So 1 John 1 9 is really referring to keeping our hearts right with God. When our conscience pricks us when it, it prompts us that we think I shouldn't be doing that, I shouldn't be saying that. So it's all about the heart, this, this um, scripture. It's all about how we keep our heart clear and clean before God. And that's the same in any relationship, isn't it? If we have uh, an argument with our husband or our wife or our mother or our father or our son or our whoever, then it's always good and healthy and positive to sit down and talk about it. That doesn't always happen, but it's always good to do that, to keep those lines of communication flowing. So I began to think about, the Lord gave me that Psalm uh, in the week, in Psalm 27, and it says, my heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices. When you know that God loves you, when you know there's nothing between you and God, when you know that you can come to God, that you can go into his, his uh, throne room and, and with such sort of boldness and, and into that throne room of grace, then there's nothing between you. But is there still people that think that God is a punishing God, that they don't quite meet the mark? Is there still people who think that it's down to their performance, how they act? what they do, how, how they serve God, and they never quite reach the mark. There's nobody, not one, reaches the mark. The only one that reached the full mark was Jesus Christ himself. And our Christianity is not based on performance. It's not based on how good a day you had or how bad a day you had. 
It's based on if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are who you are because of him. And there's just three things I want to talk about today in relation to relationships. The three things that came to my mind when I was reading through God's word and thinking what I would say was the three things um, is commitment, is connection or communion and compassion. The truth is that God's word is all good. His, his will for us is good and that is proved over and over again in his word. If God's commitment to us is not questionable, he is completely committed to us. And if we go back to Genesis 1, 26, God's plan came into place then. He said, let us make man in our image and likeness so that we could, he could relate to us and be in a relationship just as he was with Adam and Eve. So that was his first step of commitment to us. And then <clears throat> as we go on after the fall, he had another plan where he thought, I, Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, God says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans of a future full of hope, plans of peace. So that is another commitment God made and this final commitment that Jesus made to reconcile us back to him, to restore us, to deal with the sin issue, the sin nature once and for all was of course, John 3.16, where he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So this is a great plan and commitment that God has for us, and it's our choice whether we accept that plan or not. And if we do accept it, what do we need to do to accept this plan and commitment? Uh, what do we need to do to commit to God? Well, the first thing we need to do is accept that we need Jesus, accept that we need a saviour, acknowledge that we need a saviour, believe that we need that help in life. If you think about the tax collector and the Pharisee, the Pharisee was the person that stood and says, thus says the Lord, I've done this, I've done that. A self-righteous person that didn't recognise what they needed. But the tax collector smote his breast and says, have mercy on me a sinner. He humbled himself before the mighty hand of God. And Jesus said, this man is the man who will go home justified. And I always remember a minister preaching to me years ago and he said justified is like just as if he never sinned and that is the good news of the gospel. So why do we really need to commit to God? What is it God is looking for? Well he's looking to be in a relationship with us. He's looking to have that same relationship he had with Adam and Eve except he comes to live inside you. Romans 10 9 and 10 says for with the heart a person believes in Christ the Saviour, resulting in his justification, that is, being made righteous, being free from guilt and sin, and made acceptable to God. And with the mouth he acknowledges and confesses his faith openly, resulting in and confirming his salvation. So when we believe something, we confess it. When we have an opinion about something strongly, we confess it or you know we're saying it over and over again but there's one other thing that he's looking for at that stage he's looking for and this is a scripture that troubles people and it really fascinates me why because it wasn't a man that said these words it wasn't a minister that coined the phrase it was jesus christ himself and it's from john 3 3 but it says you must be born again you know, Nicodemus came, he was a rabbi, he was a teacher, and he came and says, how do I get this eternal life? What is it that you've got? You are from God. And Jesus Christ himself says, you must be born again of my spirit. We've got to receive his living spirit into us. And being born again is the most incredible experience 
And I'll tell you why. Because you go from darkness to light. You go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Because it, Jesus goes on to say, if you don't do this, you won't see the kingdom. This is the kingdom of God. This here, the word of God, is the kingdom. And he's left this incredible love letter for us to read every single day that is living and it's powerful. So being born again, that scripture is receiving Christ into us. And it's the most incredible day. And it's a day that we always remember. Because that is the day where your life, your eternal life, really begins. So the next thing I want to speak about is connection. How does God connect with us? How does he really speak to us? Well, first and foremost, he speaks to us through his word. John 17, 3 says that Jesus is in the garden and he says that this is eternal life, that you may know the one true, one and only true God in Jesus Christ himself. So it's all about relationship. It's all about knowing God. How do we do that? We can't do it coming to church when church is on, taking one scripture from here and from there. You know, it says that we live, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So if we're just going on a measly amount on a Sunday morning, then, you know, it's going to take a long time um, for you to really receive the truth of God's word. So it's about knowing God. John 1.14 says that his word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So God speaks to us through his word. The Holy Spirit, when we've received him, is in us. And we can commune with God daily. We don't have to really be in this building, although this building is separated and sanctified to worship God. But the Holy Spirit is in us everywhere we go. Every single thing that we do, he is with us, directing us and guiding us. His word, it tells us in Hebrews, is living and powerful. It is alive. When we open the word of God and open these books, we should be seeing, where am I in this? Where am I in this story that I read this morning, where John is trying to convey how wonderful it is to be in a relationship with God? As we read through this scripture, in verse 6, can I just jump to it me when I was reading it? It says, if we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, and we lie and do not practice the truth. Well, Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And when he's in you, he guides you in all truth. What does it mean to walk in darkness? If Jesus is the light, what does it mean to walk in darkness? Well, many years ago, a minister said this, and I never, ever forgot it. And he said, you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. You're either for God or you're against him. And that is in the Bible that we're formed. So it's not just to open the book at night, it's not just to read a wee devotional in the morning, it's to be doers of the word. James tells us to be doers of the word and not just hearers. We need to do what it says and to be connected to God. It says in John 15 5, that I am the vine and you are the branches. We will not produce the fruit of God if we're not connected to him, if we don't have love, peace, joy, if we don't connect to him and we walk in darkness and dabble in the things of the world. It's difficult for God to get through that when it says in the word that if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. So God is looking for a real connection and it's there in the word, living and powerful. The third thing I think for a relationship is love. <laughs> And it being this certain day, um, people are maybe um, buying cards and flowers and one thing and another. But the love that God gives us, the compassion we see in Jesus, the compassion that we saw um, when he was uh, dealing with the story of the, the woman that was caught in adultery, the story where he wasn't just being compassionate to her, he was being very, very compassionate to the men that were standing with the stones, the stone throwers, the criticizers, the judges, the gossipers, and yet he said, well, if there's anyone without sin, cast the first stone. You know, he was very, very compassionate to uh, those Pharisees that stood there judging. The 
first commandment says that we should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and all your strength. You know, it's an amazing scripture that God has got to come first. He's got to come first in every decision we make, every every uh, action we take, every thought we have, but he has got to be first, that relationship. If you think of this, like a husband and wife, you know, the Bible uses Christ as the bridegroom and we are the bride. He uses that analogy all the time through the word. But another great scripture in Isaiah says, for your husband is your maker. Your you know, Jesus is the person that's loving inside you. He's the person that's guiding you and the Holy Spirit is teaching you all things. The second commandment is love your neighbour as yourself. Don't judge, don't criticise. All of these things that we're taught in the Word, all to be in a healthy relationship. Any relationship could have these three things in it. These three things where we connect to each other, um, we talk to each other, we um, you know, we commit to each other, that's why people get married, and then compassion. That compassion we see in Jesus has been poured into our heart. It tells us in the Word that the love of God has been poured into our heart. So what am I really saying this morning? To be in a relationship, you have to commit to God. He's looking for a commitment. It tells you in the Word that he's a jealous God, just like if you were in any relationship and they wanted to be with that person, they would want to spend time and they wouldn't want you to be uh, spending too much time with somebody else. We connect with God through the Word. We connect by coming to church. When church is on, um, we come together. It says, do not forsake coming together. Don't forsake assembling together to come corporately to worship God and hear the Word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So God is fully committed to us, and just like it says in Revelation 3, he's coming to knock on the door of your heart. And like the door that he's knocking on, there's the lovely picture, the, the thing that's so distinctive about this door is there's no handle on the outside that Jesus is knocking, because it's your choice whether you commit, it's your choice whether you connect with God, and it's your choice whether you receive the love that he has for you. So what is the word really saying? What is this whole being in a relationship really saying? Well, the, the scripture that I refer to, if we confess our sins, he's faithful. Do you know how faithful God is? Do you know how just he is? And do you know how quick he is to forgive your sins? Because 2,000 years ago, our sins were dealt with. Our sins were dealt with on the cross once and for all, for the entire world. So that clear in our heart is us staying in good fellowship with God. You are forgiven and you are blessed and you are loved by God. So the Lord wants you to know this morning that there's nothing between you and him. I put a wee thing on social media this week and I titled it, Do You Know God or Do You Just Know of Him? Some people just know of God. They come to baptisms and weddings and funerals. But God never sent his son to die so that we could periodically just come to church and just tick the box. He's looking to be in a relationship with you. He's looking to know everything about you and he wants you to know how much he loves you. So remember this morning that God has a plan for your life. He's got a plan to, for a future full of hope plan to give you abundant life. John 10.10 10 tells us that he came to give us abundant life in everything that we do. So may God bless you this morning and realise that when we read the word of God, it's living and powerful and that is the way we relate to God. There's nothing between us. God's not in a bad mood for us. He loves us. He sent his son to redeem us, to reconcile us and to restore us back into this amazing relationship. Amen. So may God bless you this morning as you um, read, uh, listen to the word this morning. So the hymn that um, we're going to finish with this morning and, and then I'll pray is hymn 512, a lovely hymn. It says, take my life and let it be, consecrate Lord to thee, 
Take my moments and my days and let them flow in ceaseless praise. Amen. changes us. It's your word, that seed of your word that is in our heart. And as it is in our heart, it takes root, Father God, the truth of your word, your uncorruptible seed goes in our heart. And Lord, we lift up all leadership to you this morning. And we pray, Father God, that you inspire them through the word of God, that they are godly leaders and they'll make wise decisions for all of us, Lord. And we pray, Father God, for Paul, the teaching elder in this church we pray that through this period of rest lord that you would inspire them that you would give them revelation from god above that you would give them revelation from your word that he would be able to preach father god and teach your people we ask you father god that this word be sealed up with the holy spirit of god for every ear that's heard it let those that have ears to hear let them hear the word lord and Father, we just ask that you bless every single person listening, every single person here, Lord. You bless them, Father God. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.